Hello and welcome back to COM 498. So uh, this is week two of the thesis writing course. And if you have looked at the syllabus, which we can do together, you've seen that this week is a little full and it is. Um, the idea here is that we will get through quite a bit of stuff this week that will set the groundwork for everything else that we're going to do throughout the semester. Um, as you may have noticed, maybe not, I'm not sure, the, the assignment for this week, it's very simple once you see what it is, but it's going to tell us what sort of research may fit best for you in your project. doesn't mean that it's the end-all be-all and you have to do whatever um, outcome that you get from your survey, but we're going to talk about how that will help guide you. Uh, we'll talk about everything you see there, the two dimensions of theory and research. We're going to get into some head, heady stuff with meta theory, meta theoretical assumptions, quantitative versus qualitative research, the IRB. Now, before we get going, let me just say this. There will be times where it probably will feel a little overwhelming, but it's, it's something that you can definitely take in and digest. Uh, and it will it will help you really not just for this project, but for in the future deciding what type of research you need to do to find what you're looking for. Now, depending on who you had as a professor for Com 275, 375, some of this may be completely new to you. Some of it may be familiar. You may know all of it. I don't know. I know everyone teaches those courses a little differently. So what I like to do is sort of go back and reteach the things, at least from those classes, that you will need to know, which is here, um, before we move on to some specific approaches to research. And we'll do that starting uh, next week a little bit. But for today, um, you see that we've got the research design survey. So let's scroll down to week two. And there it is. So for this one, it says, answer each question by selecting one of the two options provided. Each selection is worth one point, and then you're going to add those up. So you'll read the item. You'll pick one of these two, whichever one you have more of at the bottom. You might think about uh, doing a certain style of research. So you see at the bottom here, if you have more from the left column, you may want to go quantitative. It seems to fit you. If you go to the right side, you may want to go qualitative. Now, what we're going to do is talk about this survey, and then I'm going to share some information that you saw above. And then we'll come back to this survey at the end because it will fit. It'll show you sort of why asking these specific questions will be an effective way to get you to a research style. Um, so first one, which best describes your ontological assumptions about reality? Even if you don't know what ontology means yet, you will shortly. You can choose between these two. Reality exists no matter what we think about it. So it's just, it is what it is. It's out there. We can't really change it. I mean, you could have an effect on it, but in terms of, you know, the sun always rises in the east, sets in the west, the ground, grass is green, sky is blue kind of stuff. Versus, we create our own reality through what we do. So in other words, um, one example might be that, I don't know if you can even see this, but like this is a screwdriver. And so on the, on the left side, we would all look at this and say, that's a screwdriver. But on the right side, it would depend on what we're doing with it um, that would tell us what it is. So if I were poking holes in paper with this, maybe I needed to you know do some hole punching and didn't have a hole punch. So I was going through and poking it with my screwdriver, well, suddenly this becomes a hole poker, if you will. Um, if you were in a terrible situation and this is all you had on you, but you needed a defensive weapon, now maybe it becomes a defensive weapon. Um, you've got an itch that you just can't quite reach. This becomes a scratching tool. So that idea of reality on the right, that we create it no matter, or we create it through what we do, is the idea that uh, reality is something that the human experience allows for. Uh, the number two item here, which best describes your epistemological assumptions about knowledge? And again, you'll learn what these terms mean shortly. 
Um, on the left, knowledge is objectively discovered through evidence. So this is very much like the hard sciences. We want to know what is stronger, what will take more force to break it. Is it this screwdriver or is it this pin? Um, and we could do some study that would help us know that answer. And it would be through evidence. We could try the same amount of pressure on each one until one broke first. And we could say because of that evidence, that's, who, that's what's strongest. Now, the alternative might be knowledge is different for everyone and we find what we can agree on. This kind of goes to that idea, the pen is mightier than the sword, right? So if I said which one of these is stronger, and let's say we found out that the steel screwdriver was stronger than the plastic pen, that would make sense physically, but maybe you interpreted it as what's stronger, a screwdriver that can maybe screw together or unscrew some things or a pen that can write down any sort of, you know, great or terrible message can make things happen. It can give directions. You may say that the pen is stronger again, depending on your interpretation. The third item, what do you think about the predictability of humans on the left? You may say humans are predictable. If you know, uh, and study human behavior, you almost can predict what humans will do. There are exceptions. And that's where the next side comes in. Humans are not predictable. They're unpredictable because while we may expect certain things, that's just a, a norm, but not a, it's not a rule, right? It's, it's sort of a, a loose agreement, but mm, there's always exceptions. People can always surprise you. So maybe that's where you fall on this, uh, on this issue. Number four, what do you think about rules? Do rules apply to everyone or are rules unique to people in some situations? And I don't mean, you know, people above the law and all this. What, what I'm saying here is more of a, a scientific approach to thinking about rules. So if you think that, um, you know, humans need uh, air to breathe, well, that's a rule about humanity. But could that be unique to people in some situations? Maybe, maybe. I mean, maybe you could think about the way that, um, you know, people who are on oxygen need a specific type of oxygen or even probably a better example would be do rules apply to everyone? And then maybe it's like grammatical rules where well, you say, yeah, sure. Grammatical rules apply to everyone that speaks a common language. Well, then you got to think, well, what about different dialects of English. They don't have the exact same rules, but they still make sense. We can still understand the message. So does that mean that they really need to follow the rules? It's up to you. It's up to you to decide that. Number five, what's more important? Is it A, predicting and controlling things that happen? So being able to tell if I do X, then Y will be the result and I can make that happen or I can make that not happen. Or is it more important to you to understand why these things happen? So why does X lead to Y? Um, so if you're thinking about uh, communication specifically and you think of a relationship, well, when we insult someone that we are friends with or, or you know, significant others with, we're probably going to hurt our relationship. Why does that happen? Well, because you said something hurtful. Therefore, the result was a weakened relationship. Okay. Um, that's why that happens. But is it enough to just know that insults equal weak relationships? Or is it more important to know that insults hurt feelings, hurt feelings translate to a uh, diminished sense of care from another person. And that diminished sense of care then translates to a weaker relationship. Some people just want to know what happens. Others want to know why it happens. Number six, what do you think about truth? Is it an absolute and hardly ever changing idea that the truth is the truth is the truth? Um, or do you think that the truth is always in flux and it varies by person, by culture, or by situation? Um, and again, this doesn't go for two plus two is four. And then in different situations, it might be three or it could be five. That's, that's not the idea here. The idea here is more about human truth. So is it true that humans 
uh, are gregarious or that humans like to be around other humans. They like to socialize. Well, you know, for someone on that left column, they would say, yes, overall, humans are gregarious creatures. They like to gather together. And the pandemic preventing that is uh, causing some really big issues. Other people will say, well, I don't know if you can say most humans. I think most humans gather together because they're expected to be gregarious. But are they really? Are they, are they doing it because they want to gather or are they just gathering because they feel they're supposed to? And that might depend on the culture or the person or the situation. Again, some folks want to know one thing. Others want to know something else. And last, what produces better or more useful information? Following the scientific method where you form a hypothesis, you make an observation, form a hypothesis, do some background research, you do a, sort of a test, and then you come to a conclusion from that. Or is talking to individuals and getting their opinions and experiences a better use of time when it comes to useful information? Again, the scientific method will tell you what is happening, but talking to individuals will tell you more about why things are happening or uh, the impact of what's happening. Now, again, with all of these, there's no right or wrong answer. You're on some of these going to be struggling to choose between the left column and the right column, but that's, that's an important distinction to make. And again, if you have sort of a, a balance approach here, which you can't be even, that's why I only add seven items and not, you know, six or eight, um, you're probably going to see a little bit of a direction on where to go. Now, let's say you're, you know, four to three, one side or the other, you've probably got a little more um, flexibility or you could use what we will call later a mixed methods approach where you try to do a little bit of quantitative and qualitative. Um, I would guard against that for this class. That usually requires a little more work. Uh, you can definitely do it, but realize it will take more of your time. So we're trying to figure out again, are you more of a quantitative or qualitative person? And the way we're going to do that is partially through this survey, but more importantly, it's through this section of uh, the class. So we're going to come back to that, as I said, and in order to understand what all of that stuff meant, we need to get into the material for this week. And you see it here, the two dimensions of theory and research. Um, again, some of these, these words are going to be new and you're going to feel like it's Greek. It actually kind of is, but that's okay. Um, stick with it. And, and I think you'll be able to, to grab this. No problem. So the first item there is, is ontology or what it said above your ontological assumptions. You can drop that word and, and tell people you went to college and got really smart. Uh, but ontology is your view of reality. So on the objective side, the left column again, just like above, uh, this is realism. Reality exists with or without us. It is what it is. And we've sort of talked about that. You know, it doesn't matter what you experience necessarily as an individual. The overall human experience is something completely different. It is something that is real and it, it is what it is, as they say. On the right side, if you're more of a subjective person, and those are the two big categories here, objectivism and subjectivism, uh, subjectivism is idealism, that reality is created by us and it is what we make it. That goes back to the old, what is this question, if I can hold on to it, a screwdriver. What is it always or is it what is it right now? You could even say right now this isn't a screwdriver. If you're on the, the right side, you could say that this is a uh, an example tool that we're using for this class that would work for some folks other folks would say no it's a screwdriver that you're using as an example other folks would say oh no he's using an example right now that is a screwdriver you see what i'm saying which one comes first for you um the the, the ancient oh gosh uh, for, as soon as he says ancient you know it's going to be something uh, just out there, but it's a Native American tribe, and I want to get the, the tribe right, but it's not coming to me. I think it's the Sioux. Um, in their, their old language, wouldn't say that there was a chair. 
they would say that that object is cheering because right now put together in that form the parts are cheering because they're forming a chair but they don't have this object permanency in terms of the language we use to describe it because if you took apart a wooden chair you know it would be sticks and uh, planks and that sort of thing uh, but again even those would be sticking or planking and so you know it, there's a lot of different ways to view this but for us we need to pick between these two um, objective no matter what we do we're just outside observers looking at something taking it in or subjective we're in there and we are participating in this creation of reality now similar epistemology is how do we know what we know uh, one way to think of ontology is what do we know reality what do we know about it and then epistemology is how do we know that we know that so for this one on the left side with objectivism you've got positivism or knowledge being objectively discovered that evidence is key again this is like truth is out there under a rock somewhere and we just have to uncover it you could you could almost think of this like colonialism in the sense that like you know we talk about Columbus discovering America like you know America the continent was just a, a landmass out there waiting for someone from Europe just to discover it you know that's one view but on the other side you might say mm, let's take a more constructivist approach where knowledge is relative to each person consensus is key so when you know Europeans arrived in the Americas there were people already there. People were already here, right? And they were called the Native Americans. We call them now Native Americans. So when someone showed up and said, look, we discovered this, they're thinking, you know, how, how you discover it? We were already here. So you, did you really discover it? We were already living in it. You know, this isn't like um, you discovered a new cure for something. Uh, this was a, a landmass, right? So with that one, Sorry about the dogs. The constructivism idea is that knowledge is relative to each person, and it's what we agree on that matters. So that idea that consensus is key. So the Native Americans probably got together and said, every one of them, uh, yeah, no, you didn't discover this. This was ours. We're here. And that's the truth for them. Whereas the Europeans, more positivism, would say, nope. You were out here in the middle of nowhere. No one's made contact with you yet except us. So here we are. We discovered you. What do you think? Next up, you've got human nature. With human nature, you can talk about determinism versus free will. And with this one, determinism basically says that behavior is predictable. You see it there. Biology and environment make us who we are. So this doesn't really pick between nature and nurture necessarily because it accounts for both in determinism right that behavior is predictable because of nature and nurture so if we know um, in terms of nature that you have two healthy intelligent parents and we know from nurture that you were raised in a um, nurturing and educational atmosphere we can predict that you're probably going to be somewhat intelligent uh, but can we also then say if your parents were just average or below average intelligence and you came in from an environment that was, you know, it was okay, wasn't anything great, it wasn't, wasn't terrible, wasn't wonderful, will you obviously then be not as intelligent? On average, probably, but is it fair to say that as an overarching sort of assumption? Others would say, no, that's, that's not the case at all. That's free will or the idea that behavior is not predictable and we're all autonomous. So that person who comes from um, a, a, a less prestigious background, they still, according to this view, have that ability to decide what they want to be, how smart they want to be. They can make these decisions to go to school, to study harder, to, to really put in the time to learn things that... Someone else may have almost more naturally, if you will, but just through the, the being around a more intellectual or educated atmosphere, 
they've picked this up already, where the other person may have to work a little harder for it. Now, problems with that could be that on the left side, the determinism side, folks that come from great backgrounds might just not care. And, you know, if that's the case and you don't pay attention to the lessons you're being taught, does that still mean that you're likely to be successful or intelligent? Then with the free will side, sure, a lot of people do sort of um, pick themselves up by the bootstraps, as we say, and, you know, decide that they're going to make something of themselves. But then what about the restraints that society puts on those folks? Maybe they can't, because of the, where they're from, the background, they can't afford to go to college and therefore they can't take themselves to that next level because that's not something they had the option to partake in. Again, it's no, no wrong or right answers here. It just um, is choices that we all have to make about what we think of human nature. And again, I know that this is new stuff. And as you look at this, you're like, well, I could see it either way. I can too. But for these purposes, for research, one of the, the things you'll need to do is come to a, a conclusion about where you are on these issues. And that's going to make your research much more um, streamlined. And it's going to make it easier to do less nerve wracking. Uh, the next idea here, the purpose of theory. We'll talk more about theory next week. But uh, theory on one side, the left there, is to create universal laws, causal relationships, and again, predict and control. So <clears throat> you'll hear about like, you know, the, the, the law now of gravity, right? We know that gravity is a thing, that it has the same amount of pressure across the earth, and that things are pushed down by this invisible force. Well, in, in our area, and I say our in terms of comm study scholars, or the communications disciplines at large, uh, are we trying to create a theory that tells us exactly what will or uh, should happen? Or is it on the right side here to create more of an understanding as to why something happens? So for example, and you'll hear again more next week, but my, I guess, theory that I am, <clears throat> excuse me, most familiar with or an expert on is communication accommodation theory, which in a nutshell says that if you're speaking to someone and you want them to like you, in that conversation, in that interaction, you're going to shift the way you communicate in order to be more like them because then they will have what's called similarity attraction. They'll say, oh, I like them. They're a lot like me. And then they're more likely to show you favor. <clears throat> Again, is that the goal of that theory? Is it to say, if I do that, then this will be the, the outcome. So if I match them or accommodate toward them, will they then show me favor? Are we trying to make that prediction, that causal relationship, or is it more over on the other side? Situational rules. So, you know, some folks will notice that you're, you're accommodating toward them, and they may think, maybe, let's say you're mocking them. Um, if you, the theory says that if you come uh, to this uh, you know, style of communication, you're trying to be more like them, but they can determine that you're doing it in order to you know, get their favor, uh, without having to work for it, it's going to backfire on you. So with that one, is that just really telling us why we may do something, why we may change our style up? Or is it the left column giving us a prescription to being liked in this case? Last but not least, the view of truth, is it absolute? It is what it is, what it is, or is it in flux and based on time, culture, and setting? You know, this one's, this one's a little bit tough because you can see it both ways. I mean, two plus two is always four. It's absolute. But the idea that if you accommodate to someone, they're going to find favor, find you favorable is based on the setting in the person, right? So, boy, you got to pick one. It's going to be tough. All right. Uh, with these, now, let me, let me just pause here for a moment and tell you. There's not going to be a quiz on this stuff. Now, that doesn't mean turn the video off. God, don't do that. You're going to need to know this. So again, you can choose your approach to research. But I don't want you to go back and rewatch 15 times and try to write everything down and study and know, you know, this chart. This is actually a, a charts or tables, rather, that I made myself in in my grad program because I had to learn all this and this made sense to 
put it together this way to put it in my brain. For you, you're always going to be able to come back to this and look and say, okay, well, I think this, I think that, I think the other thing. So therefore I'm more on this side or that side. So don't stress out as we talk about these new things that are unfamiliar because they'll get less and less familiar. So let's go to the next chunk of this. Number two, the methodological distinctions of communication based research. And again, these are the big two, which are quantitative and qualitative. And they continue those columns down because if you are over here more of an objectivist, then you're probably going to steer more toward quantitative research. However, if you're over here and you're a subjectivist, you're more likely to steer toward qualitative research. And so let's talk about what the difference is in terms of just the research. Let's get that out of the way. So first of all, what's the emphasis of the research? Well, if it's quantitative, you see it there, systematic understanding or the use of the scientific method. So you're really, again, trying to understand a system. Just that word is a systematic. So this larger um, phenomena or existence, like the human experience, maybe that's what you're trying to understand. That doesn't mean that every single human will fit into this understanding of the human experience. But it does tell us that quantitative research is more what we would call, and we'll see it in a minute, generalizable or able to be applied to a larger group of people. And that's usually true, but that doesn't mean that it's perfect and it doesn't claim to be. Now, what's the emphasis of qualitative research? Well, subjective accounts or what they say, getting inside of a situation. And that's that understanding why something happened, what the impact of that thing happening was, um, and, and, and so on and so forth. Now, what about the goal of the research? Well, as I said, quantitative work is meant to be generalized. It's, it's supposed to help us predict and control the world around us. So again, if uh, I'm trying to think of more communication examples, with, with the vaccine, for example, one of the reasons people are not taking COVID seriously and not taking the vaccine in some cases seriously is because of the way it was explained to us early and then throughout the pandemic. Um, there is an idea out there that basically says if we frame something in an important way, we will then the receiver of that message will see it as important. Now, that's not a, a novel idea. There are different approaches to it. There's a thing called Monroe's Motivated Sequence um, that will craft messages that will help them be more persuasive. There's um, the Toolman model that will tell us why we need to believe something, do something, and we can make a good argument that way. Um, so these things are out there. And, you know, if the goal is to predict behavior and we're trying to get people to take COVID seriously and get the vaccine, well, then the way we frame that discussion should be considered because we can predict that if we talk about it in an effective way, people are more likely to take it seriously or get the vaccine. But if we don't, well, we see what's happened. Now, for qualitative research, we want a deep understanding and exploration of what's going on. Or um, there's a researcher named Bakhtin who calls this a rich description. And if you use that same example, this wouldn't be so much about what message can we send in order to predict control that people will feel important uh, about the vaccine and they'll go get the vaccine. Instead, this is more what process, what thought process do they go through because of the message they have? What comes to mind for them? What are they comparing this to? What are they um, worried about or why aren't they worried about certain things? And so we get a lot more information from the qualitative side of things. But the folks on the left are just saying, hey, we need to get shots in arms. And so let's focus on that first and later we can follow it up. Again, is there a right or wrong answer? Not really. What about when you're collecting your data? Uh, on the, the left for quantitative work, you are going to rely heavily on experiments and or surveys. Um, for us, surveys will probably be the go-to if you're in this column. And that's got its whole own chunk in this class where we talk about making 
or finding, more importantly, uh, an effective, appropriate survey. But that's what we're going to use. We're going to use tools in order to collect data and to examine it. However, on the other side, the qualitative side, we're going to use things like interviews and observations. Now, that makes the researcher the, the key tool. It's not the survey design, the piece of paper with the, the questions, the, the items, the statements on it, the Likert scales and true, false, and all that. This makes you, the person collecting that data, the number one tool because you're talking to people. So you have to ask them the right questions, just like that survey does. You have to then interpret their responses in the right way. The survey gives them options to select from, which are sort of predetermined meanings. You, though, would need to dig a little deeper to find out what exactly was meant by a response. So again, there's a little more work. It does give you a bigger, arguably, understanding of what's going on, but you are the instrument there. And that goes with that next item. Now, uh, with sample, this means the number of people that are involved in your study. And if you are doing something that you want um, to be generalized, a quantitative study that you want to be able to say, I can say with some degree of certainty that humans across the board will do this, or even let's shrink it. Grand Valley students across the board will do this if this is presented. Okay. Um, they will buy more parking passes if they are offered uh, at half price for two days. We can probably do a survey. Would you buy it if it were regular price? Maybe not. Would you buy it if it were at half price? Yeah. Would you buy it if it were half price for just two days? That's called the scarcity principle. It's a limited time offer. Oh yeah, people would buy them. Okay, great. We, we know that. But we're going to need a large representative population. I'm sorry, sample of the population. Population is what we're predicting about. The sample is what we use to make that prediction. It's a a piece of the population used in our study. So again, this needs to be large. You could make it systematic if you're only trying to learn about Grand Valley students. Well, then it doesn't matter what non-Grand Valley students think. It's all about the right uh, representation of that larger group. Now, if your sample is uh, something that's coming from a qualitative study, it's going to be much smaller and much more purposefully selected. So if you're trying to understand um, the, we're talking about parking passes and money, maybe so you on the qualitative side want to know how the pandemic has changed the way we think about finances and with job losses and economic hardships, what has that done to our thinking about buying things like a parking pass. Before, if you lived near campus, maybe you thought, I'm going to get a parking pass anyway. I don't want to ride the bus. Well, did this change your mind? Did this sort of make you think, boy, every dollar counts. I'm, I'm going to ride the bus. It's cheaper than buying a parking pass. Or is it the other way? And you say, you know, before I rode the bus because I live close, but now I'm going to buy a parking pass because I don't want to be on mass transit with a deadly virus going around. Right, It could go either way, but you would know if you talk to some folks that were making those sorts of decisions. You would at least see the thought process that went on. Now, for a viewpoint, as I mentioned with objective and subjective, objective is outside looking in. So you sort of, as the researcher, remove yourself. Um, the, the Greek terms epoche. You block out everything that you assume or know about a situation and you just watch it as though it's the very first time you've seen it, and you try not to make any prejudgments uh, about the behavior you're seeing. You just want to know what is happening. But if you're over on the other side, you're inside either looking outward or inside looking around, really. Um, so with that, it's when you, know, you don't try to separate yourself from your work. And you can make the argument that it's impossible to do that because... You know, it, even as a quantitative researcher, folks are still choosing their research topics. Why did they choose that? Is it because they were simply hired to research that topic? Maybe, sometimes. But generally, even folks that are quantitative will study things that interest them or that they think are important. And therefore, we can't fully remove ourselves and just be this island outside looking in. 
but we have to try to be as much as we can if we're going that route. So viewpoints, quantitative, you're sort of observing as an outsider. Um, viewpoint for qualitative, you're inside taking that look around. Directionality. Um, this is an important idea here to understand, but there's either deductive approaches or inductive approaches. And here's sort of how you might remember this. Um, it's true. This is the way I remember this when I went over this in my doctoral program. But if it's if something is a deductive approach to understanding and generating knowledge, you start with this large uh, observation and then you try to get down to something very specific. So you might say something like, um, I've noticed that many humans are more stressed out now because of the pandemic. That's your observation. Now you want to see if you can get more specific. So you'll design a survey questionnaire and it will ask people, are you more um, anxious, worried, uh, stressed now than you were before. Um, the main cause of your stress is which of these best describes it. Those kind of questions. And then you can get down to very specific. 73% of people who took my survey were more stressed out now in pandemic than they were before. They say the number one reason that they are more stressed out is maybe it's finances <clears throat> and that, you know, whatever else you find. But it's going to be very specific findings. On the other hand, for qualitative folks, it's something small they notice. So this might be, you know, I, I'm feeling like I am more stressed out because of pandemic. I wonder how many people out there feel like I do. Hmm, I should ask. So we're starting very small and we're getting bigger. So let me go ask my two best friends just to do sort of a, a check. Are you all also more stressed out? You are. Why? That's the reason I'm stressed out more too. So now we have a little bit of a theme that's emerged. So what we might do, if we want to know if Grand Valley students are more stressed out, then we would recruit, you know, some random Grand Valley students and we would interview them and ask them, hey, are you more stressed out? If so, why? Um, specific things that are leading you to be more stressed out than others. And they would talk to us about that. And then we would not be able to generalize it and say, I talked to five people, therefore all of Grand Valley is feeling this way. But what we would be able to say is, if you are feeling this way, I think I have uh, an idea as to why you're feeling this way. So now it would be itty bitty, that's inductive, starts with an I, itty bitty, um, start with I feel this way, a little bigger, my friends also feel this way, a little bigger now, Grand Valley students are feeling uh, this way if they're stressed at all. Here's probably why. On the other side, deductive starts wide. True, this is how I remembered it. Damn, that's big. So D, deductive, damn, big and wide. You start with this larger observation and then you move to something more specific. So that's the, the sort of directionality of research. And, you know, a lot of times you will be designing your research and this won't ever come up and it, it may not for you. But if you find that you're stuck a little bit in the way you're going to write questions or the way that you really want to investigate something, coming back and knowing this directionality idea can give you some guidance on how to do that instead of just, you know, willy nilly, here's 10 questions I thought might work. Now you can order them in a way that would allow you to go from a bigger observation to a specific conclusion or a specific observation to a more general conclusion. Uh, last two things here, value of research. What about the value of methodological distinction? Well, if you're on the quantitative side, you see it as theoretical or applied, meaning you're just adding to knowledge uh, in theory about the human experience and why and how we communicate. If it's applied, that means that you're able to actually implement it somewhere, your findings. So if I know that 70% of Grand Valley students are more stressed out. Just knowing that, maybe not knowing why, but I know they are, I could take that to the administration and say, listen, our students are really stressed out. We need more counselors available in the counseling center. And that should be evidence enough to say that we do need that. Now, they may come back, hear me out, and ask, 
Well, what kind of counselors? We have grief counselors, we have drug counselors and alcohol counselors, we have um, grief, or sorry, I guess I already said that, um, trauma, these sorts of things, different specializations. That's more on the other side. The value being critical for qualitative. Critical just means uh, using research to make a positive change in the world. Okay. So what can we do to change the situation and make it a little bit better? This could be in terms of finding out why people are stressed and removing some of those stressors, but it could also be just like the other one, putting more strategic resources in place. So now I know that people are um, more stressed out and they're mostly stressed out about finances. Well, now we need some financial counselors that can talk to students about their finances to set them on a, a, a correct course to saving money and to using it wisely. Last but not least, um, when you're thinking of your methods and writing this up, the language style you use will change a little. If you're doing a quantitative study or something on that objectivist side, you're going to want to be very formal. You'll have a very strict structure to follow. And you will not use the term I or even the researcher. Um, that'll just be thrown out. Uh, instead, you're going to simply almost be uh, clinical with the way that you write. You're, 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 you're not trying to be fluffy and flowery. Um, it's To me, it is its own art form. Uh, but for others, they would just say it's, it's utilitarian. It's just trying to get a job done. It's not trying to make you think a certain way or uh, make your emotions be in favor or against whatever it is you're talking about. It's just, here's the facts. Here's what we found. Um, here's what we think. That's it. Don't care what you think or feel about it. It's just the, the way it is. On the other side, the language can be much less formal and structured with qualitative research. That's not to say that you can just write it however you want or that it's not uh, structured at all or it's not some level of formality at all. It's just saying that it's much more relaxed in terms of the rules. And normally you can say I because you are the main research instrument. So for the quantitative side, people would say survey results indicated that and they would state it. You on the other the other side with qualitative would say things like I talked to four people and they all told me that they feel this way. Those responses seem to indicate to me that and you see you're still coming to the same sort of function. You're, you're, you're making a conclusion. You're drawing a conclusion from your, your information that you've gathered, but it's just done in a little bit different way between the two styles. So Again, stick with me on this. Let's sort of look at it big picture, okay? You're on the left side, objectivism. You're really focused on this is a reality no matter what. Um, we, we discover things. We keep doing scientific studies until we really make these universal laws that will allow us to predict and control things. We do that through the scientific method because we want to generalize. We want to use um, some survey instruments, questionnaires that we can spend time designing and making just right. Uh, and we want to make sure that we are standing outside looking in when we create our knowledge. If you're on the other side, subjectivism, you know, reality's in flux. We make it as we go, as long as we all can agree on it. Um, we do have free will. So even if you're from a good or bad situation, you can turn out bad or good, depending on what choices you make. Um, it's impossible to say that one thing always leads to this specific other, but we can understand why it does sometimes. Um, you know, we want to talk to people. We want to find out what they think, what they feel, what they've experienced so that we can then make a positive change in the world. There, there are two different styles of research, but they're not as different as a lot of people make them out to be. Um, and I think you can also see how they can work together. Now, again, for our purposes, mixed method studies can get messy, can get a little difficult to, to pull off, especially at this stage in your game. But you might realize, I mean, the way I see this is both are necessary. 
I mean, objectivism. I need to know what is happening. I need to know that 70% of students are stressed out. That's important for me to know. But I also need to talk to some of those 70% and find out why they're stressed out and what that's doing to them. It's not really helpful just to know that 70% are stressed out and that's the end of it. It's better than nothing, but that's all I got. If I talk to four people and I know that they're stressed out for a specific reason, that it's hitting them in a certain way, that's great. But what about everybody else? Is this across the board? I don't know because I didn't do a bigger study. Is one better than the other? It depends on your opinion. It depends on your opinion. And you're going to make some distinctions about that. I have my own thoughts on this, uh, but I'm going to hold those until next week when we go through your quiz. So uh, before we get any further, let's jump back up to this. And you see now what I'm talking about, making these really boiled down, simplified decisions uh, is important so that we'll see if you're more on one side or the other. Okay. Uh, here's another way to sort of view this. Let me see if I can slide this over a little bit. Um, you should read this left to right, not up and down. So if your ontological view is realism, determinism, that humans uh, have limited free will, then you probably also believe that the social world can be explained, that truth is out there, um, that values really don't matter in research. You're just separating yourself, that the purpose is a universal or generally universal law that will predict and control, and that your approach is scientific method. If you're more on the nominalist side, it's just the opposite. You're more subjectivist. The world is explained through different individuals. Research is what's known as value-laden, or it, values have a big role to play in research. You do something because you want to make a positive change. It's critical research. Um, that there are situational roles in life that we can't make these universal laws, but we can see truth about little pieces and then we want to maybe focus on phenomenology which we'll talk about later as an approach to where we can get some interview stories we can get some qualitative data to allow us to understand things on a deeper level there is a third option and that's here social constructivism that's uh, reality is basically created through human agreement that uh, the only realities are the ones that we agree upon, which there are fewer and fewer of these days, which is the problem with this view, that you can't eliminate uh, values from research, but they've, they've got to be sort of put aside. We have to have a mutual agreement as terms of a, a situational rule or a covering law or a universal rule. Uh, we just need to find what we generally consensus uh, agree upon and then we can use a blended approach or a mixed method approach. Um, there's also what's called Heideggerian throneness, which in a nutshell says uh, for the nature and nurture, if you're thrown into a particular situation, you can still react to it in the way you choose, but only within the confines of your social construct, right? Your social situation. This stuff gets deep. Take a philosophy class if you want to get deeper into that. I just want to give you this background so that you can understand why you're doing research the way that you're doing it. Now, um, the last thing to talk about here are some quantitative and qualitative approaches. I am not going to tell you today how to do all these. I'm just going to tell you why you might do them and what they are. Um, and to do that, I want to, let's see if I can jump out of here. Let's do that. Oops, ignore that one. Let's do this. And I've put together a PowerPoint that is more um, probably entertaining for me than it is to you. Let me open this back up here. So we're going to think of our researcher as this guy. This is my son, Levi. So meet Levi. 
Great guy. You may hear him upstairs. Today I can hear him. Maybe maybe you did too. Um, let's say that in life, as we move forward, we have a lot of great wide open space out there. And regardless of which side of this issue we're on, there are many choices. However, Levi here has to make a decision as a researcher, and he's only got two choices forced upon him, admittedly, just like you do. Uh, on one hand, he could be more objectivist. He could be a quantitative minded person or someone that believes in realism, determinism. Or he could be more subjective, qualitative minded, or subscribe to nominalism and constructivism viewpoints. You can't do both 100%, and most people don't, but we're going to see which side he favors. It could get us to the same ending, but he's going to have different routes he can take. So if you're on the left side, you know that's more quantitative. If you're on the right side, you know that's more qualitative. So let's start out with the quantitative stuff. Now, you can see if we go back over to this guy that we've got our quantitative methods listed out. There are more than two, but for us, these are the two biggies that we'll focus on. So survey work, targeting a large group, it's faster than other forms. Um, these ideas of validity and reliability are important. So if we make a survey, we have to check to make sure it's valid, that it's measuring what we intend it to measure. If, if it's not, then we don't really have anything. And we also need to make it reliable. So even if it measures what we intend it to measure, does it do it consistently? And it's sort of like a bathroom scale. Um, if you get on that scale and it, like I hop on there and it says I weigh 93 pounds, that is not at all accurate. But if I get on it 10 times and it always says between 92 and 94 pounds, it's reliable it's consistent. It's just not accurate. It's not valid. At the same time, let's say that you get on the scale and it gives you 90 pounds and then you do it again and it's 250 pounds. You do it again. It's 160. You see, you know, it's, it's always going somewhere else, but it's, is it, is it accurate? No, it's neither one. It's not consistent or accurate. So it's not valid or reliable. Um, maybe, you weigh 150 pounds and it tells you that four out of five times. Well, it's fairly accurate, but it's not really reliable in that sense. So survey questions have to be written very thoughtfully and there's statistical tests we can do to make sure that we're measuring what we intend to measure and that we're doing it repeatedly. Um, I really got to tell you, please, if you go this route and I've, I'm fine with that, of course, Make sure that you're trying to use an existing survey, even if it is, uh, you know, three different surveys and you want to take little pieces out of each one. We can make that work. That's going to make your life so much easier than trying to go start to finish on a survey. I mean, in my doc program, we had a whole course, whole semester, 15 weeks on survey design. So, I mean, that could be your project. If you if your project is to create a, a valid and reliable survey, let's do it. I mean, that's fine. We can make that happen. Um, but that's, that's again, up to you. Um, the last thing there, just remember, we can combine them. We'll have to do some statistical testing, but it can be done. So why would we maybe want to use this? Well, let's jump back over to our friend Levi here. Um, let's say he wants to examine parents who curse. Me? Never. Um, I do, but I try to never curse around around him yet. And, you know, I'm not perfect, so it's happened here and there. So every time I do, I think to myself, oh, no, I've screwed him up somehow. He's going to repeat it. Thankfully, nothing yet. Um, but let's say he wanted to do a survey. Well, he might come up with these questions or these items for his survey. Does your father curse? Does your mother curse? which best describes why your father curses. Same for your mother. Is it anger? Is it because they're tired? Are they trying to be funny? Or do they just always do it? Now, if someone was taking this, and we'll assume it's other little kids like Levi, they may think that their, let's say, father curses um, to be when he's angry. That's the only time he curses. 
But in reality, they may not have enough exposure to him yet in a variety of situations to know he's not always angry. He just always uses this type of this type of language. Or they may not be able to discern between being angry and being tired and therefore maybe grumpy, which is different from angry. The, the positive side of a survey like this is that it puts things in nice, clean categories. The downside to a survey like this is that it puts things in nice, clean categories. You can't ex- you know, sort of expand on anything. You can't say, you know, well, he he is someone who does this quite a bit when he is angry, but he's only angry late at night. And so I think that may be because he's tired. They can't circle two, you circle one. On the other hand, that qualitative work that we'll get to, you could get that extra information. So maybe this is the way Levi wants to go. I don't know. What he could also do from that, though, if he found out that 78% of, let's see, father's curse, then he could follow it up and say, how does being exposed to cursing impact a child? And then he may ask someone in a survey again, um, were you exposed to cursing? Yes or no? If you said no, then you're finished. Thank you for taking the survey. If you said yes, do you think on a scale of one to 10 that you had a positive or a negative impact on you with the one being very negative and the 10 being very positive, what's your number? And then you can sort of gauge it, right? That's an instrument, just like your speedometer on a car is an instrument. Now, figuring out where people put their mark, that becomes your instrument and you combine them together and you see what's more, um, more common. So then we can combine that. We can state some conclusions. Um, again, the other style may not have these percentages or these overarching sort of generalities where we could say that 73% of whatever population kids at Allendale Elementary School um, have experienced this and this is what they think about it. It's positive or negative. They could really tell the story of someone with much more detail if they interviewed them which would be on the other end of the research spectrum. Um, Yeah, and he could come to these results. You know, that's a lot of good information, but without context, sometimes it's probably not all that great. Now, the next thing is an experiment. Maybe Levi needs dad for this. We're going into the lab, so I got my lab coat on. I had a little more hair then, but not much. Um, If we think about experimental design here, you'll see that this is a method that allows researchers to see the impact of a treatment or an intervention on a group of people. So when you introduce something new, you can tell how it changes people or their performance, behavior, thinking, et cetera. Um, A big example of this right now are the vaccine trials that have been going on. Um, So they, in this situation, you see it there, They will divide the sample into two groups. You've got a control and an experimental group. They're completely random. The control group gets no intervention, and the experimental group does get an intervention. It's possible that it's what's called single blind, which means the control group knows they're the control group, and the experimental group knows they're the experimental group. Um... But it could be double blind, which means nobody knows who which group is except for like one or two people. It's all written down. The researchers would know uh, in a single blind who's who. In a double blind, they wouldn't. So with the the vaccine, they were giving some people just a saline injection. They were giving other people the vaccine. And they wanted to see if introducing the vaccine would come to a different outcome than just introducing the saline. And that's how they determined if it was safe or not. I mean, that's the way we do things. So for a more um, communication-based sort of example, we may think of, um, we have what's called a galvanic skin response machine in the School of Calm. Uh, And this is where you literally hook someone up to a machine with their hand and it will measure their body temperature, their tremors, the sweat production in their hands. And, you know, you can put people on this machine and some of them, you just ask them general questions, you know, nothing crazy, nothing new. 
um, and you don't introduce anything new. For the experimental group, you may ask the same questions, but now maybe you're doing it in a way that uh, is in a dark room, completely dark room, and you want to know if being in the dark makes them more anxious when they communicate. You could do that. Uh, and you would be able to see, was there a difference between the groups? Now, this experimental design requires what's known as a pretest and a post-test. So you need a, a standard, sort of a baseline measurement, which is the pretest. Um, everybody in a control group setting, no intervention, no change, no nothing inter introduced. Um, what was their response overall as the group? Then you do a post-test where you do the same thing, but now you're looking at it between the two different groups. And you want to see if there's a difference between pre- and post-test scores. If there was a difference that's statistical, uh, statistically significant, then you know that that introduction of a new item, that intervention, caused a change. Probably. There could be lurking variables, things out there that um, change the outcome that you didn't account for, but generally you're targeting that, that one or two things that you introduce to people. Now, for Levi over here, um, let's say he wants to look at parents who curse and he wants to know how the kids uh, turn out. And so he may have two groups, a control and experimental. He's going to do his pretests. Um, he's going to hook up kids to the uh, galvanic skin response machine. And for some, he's going to say, what do you think about your dad? What do you think about your mom? Do you think they're good people? Do you think they love you? Then for the other group, it might be, so your dad, he curses a lot, huh? Oh, if your dad did curse a lot, do you think he would be a very nice person? It could just be the way they ask the question in terms of communication studies, experimental designs. It's probably called quasi-experimental at that, that time. Um, and then you would, again, do the post-test to see if uh, you know that experimental group was a little more responsive, reactive through sweat and shaking and temperature changes than the control group. And then you would compare those two, all right? So again, we can do these sorts of experiments without machinery. Um, it could just be, what's your opinion on, um, let's say, political advertising? Uh, okay, so we'll see where the baseline is. Then you might follow that up with, watch this negative campaign ad. What's your opinion on political advertising now? And see if that changes perceptions uh, of something based on being exposed to this particular type of message. Okay, so Levi's back here at his crossroads. He explored the quantitative route. Now he's going to jump down the qualitative path here. Um, and the, the key thing to remember is that you, you do a lot of interviews in most qualitative research approaches. And that means you're going to need to find people. You're going to make sure that they fit um, sort of they're going to be helpful for you to answer your question. So they're going to be related to what it is you're, you're, you're checking out in some way. And from there, you can go ahead and, and talk to them and plan the interview. We'll talk all about that later. Um, so if we swing it back over, the first sort of approach here to qualitative research is a case study. Uh, a case study is when a researcher looks at a particular group or what they call a bounded system in the, the field to observe something that takes place and then to see what impacts it had. This could be a very small group or a large group. Uh, it could be well-known or obscure. So this could be the federal government uh, as a case, the American people as a case, or it could be students in our class as a case, or this three-person family as a case. Doesn't matter, um, but they, they're going to vary. So what the researcher needs to do is to interact with participants, but also interact with things like documents and artifacts. Um, that just means physical evidence of the way things are or were. So, you know, if you want to know um, about Levi's topic, right? He wants to know more about the, the outcomes of parents and, uh, and they're cursing what happens to their kids. Well, he might look for records 
of of things like you know school discipline or police records that kind of stuff let's see what he does here for this he's going to ask his questions for the interview he's going to find some themes that seem to come up over and over again and here it might be his case study let's say he wants to just interview his classmates there at Allendale, or maybe he wants to interview this three-person family. Um, great. Well, he's going to go ahead and talk to the people. He's going to look at the school records, police records, maybe background checks. He wants to then compare, this is important, compare the records to the responses. So if that three-person family is just, oh, no, we love each other so much, we never curse, we never argue or fight. But then he sees that the police have been called to that residence three times in the last year for a domestic disturbance. That doesn't quite line up with what they told him. So then he could go back and say, okay, so you feel like you are very well functioning. However, I see that the police have been here three times in the last year for the same, same reason. So how do you account for that discrepancy? Then they'll explain that ideally, and then the themes will emerge again. So again, it's it's combining interviews with records, documents, artifacts, things that exist that we can go and find. So that's a case study. Um, the next idea is a narrative. Uh, and to jump back over, a narrative is, you see here, telling a story about a phenomenon or a human experience. It's similar to reporting after an interview. Uh, so if you interviewed a witness, uh, someone that saw something happen or you read their account, it's you cleaning up their description so that you take out all the not uh, applicable information and you just put it together in a way that tells a very clear, clean story. And we call that restoring. At restorying. You can restory one person's account of something, or you can talk to multiple people that experience something from the same point of view. That's important. Um, maybe they were the child of the parent who did or did not curse. And then you can take all of those interview responses, look for the themes that emerge from those, so common threads. Then you can put all of those into a single story that will really grab what's going on but it's important as you see the last thing there you include things like background information uh, any theoretical context that might be being used uh, there could be literary elements that should be included in your story like characters conflict resolution etc this is one of those much less formal in terms of uh, clinical style writing uh, it, it's much more like you're you're doing something creative. You're telling a story. Now, you've got to be careful not to take too much creative license because then people might read your work that participated and say, mm, that's not really what I meant. So ideally what you would do is write up your report, give it to the people who you talk to, get their approval on it or edits, suggestions for change, and then you would move forward with a, a bigger release of the information. All right, so... For Levi over here, he might uh, come in and do these interviews with kids or parents, not both, but kids. And then he might collect these stories and look for the commonalities or the anomalies, things that are very different between maybe one versus the rest of these. He then goes back to re-interview or check for that complete understanding, uh, maybe after he's written a first draft. That's called, by the way, the constant comparative method. Um, no need to remember that now but you may use that one it's just when you keep looking at what you've collected putting it into themes and if there's anything left you go back to the source get more information so that it fits into a theme better if there's still something left you keep doing it until you've compared everything and all of avenues are exhausted everything's into a category then at the, the end you would weave together those stories you would take that feedback from the people who were participants and you would restory what you've what you've learned. So that's your your narrative approach. Next, we could do an ethnography. Now, um, 
ethnographies are unique. It's almost uh, sort of the, the, the edgiest of qualitative approaches to research, or really any of these. Um, so with an ethnography, you are studying a particular group of people. Like this group on the screen, I have called them, you know, the, the edgy kids. That's them. Levi's not too edgy yet. So what he's going to need to do is to get into that group somehow. You can't just walk up to the group of edgy kids and be like, hey, I want to be edgy too, but I'm not. That, they're not going to let you in. And if they do, they're not going to be honest with you. They're not going to treat you like uh, they may treat or talk to one another. So what we need to do is to find what's called a gatekeeper. We need someone who will let us into that group to gain access. Now, once you're in the group, you can either just observe see what's going on, you'll take a lot of notes, um, or you might be a participant observer. So this means that you are actually taking part in some of the rituals, the behaviors, the activities. This is almost like an undercover reporter, except they know you're a reporter. So maybe it's more like an embedded reporter with you know the military, something like that. Um, so this one has a lot of ties to investigative journalism. So if that's your area, for example, this may be the one for you. Um, for Levi over here, he had to get into the group. He had to participate in the group. He observed things. He took lots of notes. He could do formal or informal interviews. So maybe it's just him and one of the other kids sitting at lunch, and he strikes up a conversation where something comes out that he thinks is important to include. That's a very informal uh, interview. Or he may schedule interviews where he wants to sit down and talk to the members of this group. There's not a right or wrong way. It really depends on what that group will allow you to do. Um, and, and then at the end there, you're going to capture the experience of the group, what it means to them, how it impacts them. So one of the big examples of this, uh, well, it's ongoing really, but especially in the 90s. Uh, there were a lot of folks who wanted to understand the LGBTQ community because of the AIDS epidemic. And, you know, a lot of researchers who were, you know, cisgender, hetero, were trying to get into groups of LGBTQ folks and get them to talk to them openly, freely. Trust me, it's fine, you know. But when groups have been... Um, marginalized, like the LGBTQ community or minority groups, you name it, they're often distrusting of members of the, the dominant or, you know, politically, uh, socially dominant group. So if you're a white guy like me, cisgender, straight guy, and I want to go and, you know, talk to um, transgender people of color, and I want them to trust me completely and open up to me, you know, I could probably get there, but it would take a lot of effort, a lot of work. It may take years to get uh, that trust. But if you are someone who is connected to that community, doesn't mean you have to be, you know, a trans person of, of color. Um, but if you're someone connected to that, that community in some way, you're more likely to have easier access and get more honest and useful responses. So an ethnography, again, it's sort of investigative journalism, but the key thing is, can you get into the group? And if you can, are you sure they're being honest with you? And if they're not, it really doesn't matter what you find because it's all just you know, useless anyway. So you'll want to make sure that you're doing things to make sure you're, you're getting good answers. All right, next up, Levi could find out about phenomenology here. Um, if we go back over, phenomenology is similar to the narrative in that you're collecting accounts from multiple sources, but it's different because it uses multiple viewpoints. So for this one, Levi would want to interview the parents and the children. Um, you know, so with that, he's going to be able to get this holistic view or, or account of parents cursing in front of their children. We would call that in, in research world, the essence of the experience. What's it like as a whole? 
Um, and it includes things like pros, cons, um, people that love it, people that hate it, whatever it is, benefits of it. Some people are hurt by it. You know, you're, you really want to encapsulate all that. And so over here, um, Levi would probably want to talk to those folks again, look for the common themes, but not only that, look for those differences and explain those differences, and that will help him capture the essence of the experience. So let's say that the children said, um, yeah, I don't like it when, when mom or dad uses curse, curse words, and it makes me feel sad. Uh, but mom and dad said, oh, I hardly ever do it. And I don't think they even notice when I do it. So then he goes back to the kids and say, do you, do you think they do it a lot? Oh, they do it a lot. Do you notice it every time? Because when I hear it, just like something goes off in my head. Then he goes back to the parents and says, well, you know, the kids seem to really notice it and that they're triggered by it a little bit. And then the parents might say something like, oh, I think they're just being a little overly sensitive, blah, 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 blah. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Constant comparative method until everything's exhausted. Then that essence might be that you know, parents cursing in front of children is something that p children see as troubling, but parents see as inconsequential. And he could highlight, again, those that difference there, explain it, and then ideally, since this is critical research, right, trying to make the world a better place, he could offer some uh, new way of thinking that could bridge those two sides, that could make the children see it from the parent's viewpoint and make the parents see it from the children's viewpoint so that they can all have a more common understanding of what's, what's really going on, okay? So that's phenomenology. You're, you're talking to everybody that's associated with the thing, the phenomenon, and you are trying to collect these stories so that you can tell this holistic account, capture the essence. Next up, you've got a content analysis. Now, this one is a little different. Um, there's no interviews involved here. Uh, Levi will need a big pencil, though, because he's going to use what's called a code book. Um, all content analyses use code books, and they, they come about in a little bit of different ways depending on what you're looking for. Here, he's got the kids' names and then the way they feel when uh, they hear their parents curse, let's say we jump back over, we see that a content analysis doesn't involve contact with humans. It's documents and or artifacts. So uh, this one does not require the IRB, which we're going to finish with in just a few minutes. Um, but you're going to do what's called a close reading uh, or a deep study of documents, materials to understand the full context of what's going on. And you're going to use a coding system to do that so that you can sort out your evidence into different sort of piles, if you will, uh, different columns. And that's going to allow you to go back then and, and analyze what you found. Um, so this is really a mixed methods approach in that you may go through, um, let's say it is a, a diary. Okay, so you want to know how someone's parents cursing impacted them. So you get a child's diary and you go through it and you pull out every passage that deals with that particular topic. And as you're doing that, your themes for your code book, uh, which we have sadness, anger issues, and then feeling successful, you, you would create those categories. You'd write those categories down as you saw them sort of come out of that text. Then you would try to go back and put things into a little more uh, narrowed categories. So if you had sort of um, anger and maybe um, annoyed to, to separate, you might find a way to put those two together and give that a new name, and that would sort of simplify your code book a little bit. Uh, that's not necessary, but if you do this, I, I recommend it. Um, then what you can do is count up how many examples you have of, of each of those themes, and that's your quantitative element. The qualitative part comes in when you read beyond just those passages that deal with that topic and you get the context. Is this author, whoever wrote this journal, are they a sensitive person? Um, are they someone who isn't easily uh, put off or, or, or they, they're not sensitive? 
And if they are sensitive and they say that they were impacted severely, you might be able to say, maybe this is a one-off. This person seems to be very sensitive. Maybe, you know, this isn't exactly the way people experience it, but for sensitive people, this is important information. However, if you saw the same writing, but you found that the, the person writing it was not very sensitive, that they're sort of callous, they're hardened, but they were still highly impacted, boy, that tells you just how impactful the behavior is because it had that big impact on such a group. So as you go through that part, you're going to use your qualitative skills to make sense of the, that discrepancy there. You know, so what did you, what did you find? What does that mean to you? What was the author's experience with um, a parent who uses bad language in front of them? All right. So let's see what Levi ended up doing with this one. Um, he didn't do interviews. He just used ex existing documents because he didn't want to go through IRB. Um, he found the documents he wanted to study. He selected the categories from those documents. Maybe he used a theory to explain uh, sort of what he was looking for. So if it was um, a relational dialectics theory, so he wants to know about the closeness of the relationship with the child and the parent, he would be able to then use his information, take the theory and sort of lay it over top of that as a lens to view that information and then make some conclusions from that. So thank you for the help, Levi. So again, just to recap this section, Quantitative, you've got two big ones, surveys or questionnaires, um, scales, you could call it, or an experimental design. They're fairly cut and dry, although there's right ways and wrong ways to set up surveys and experiments. And very important, if you make a mistake in the design aspect of these two, your, your results are almost just not not consequential. They, they're not going to matter. They're, they're not going to be valid. For qualitative approaches, it's much more of what we would call emergent. And so you would let it change as it, as the process progresses. So a case study, again, you need to pick your case and then um, look at the relationships between people. Uh, what about documents and artifacts? So you can do a little bit of case study style work, but you would also combine that with I'm sorry, a little bit of uh, content analysis style work and combine that with your interviews of a more traditional systems like uh, narrative, for example. Speaking of, narrative is when you collect stories about an event or a behavior from uh, one or more people as long as they all come from the same viewpoint. So in this example, they're all the children, not the parents. And then you restory that. You put all that together and sort of average it, if you will, if you want to think about sort of the interpretation and you, you tell that story. Uh, ethnography is when you get into a group, you need to gain access and then explain how something is impacting that group, how they feel about it, how they're responding to it. Um, but again, you need to gain trust. Phenomenology is when you take a narrative approach, but you look at it from all angles, from, from different viewpoints so that you really get a holistic or essence of the experience um, that will be a little more all-encompassing than maybe just the narrative. And then you've got the content analysis. Again, going through documents only, no human interviews, none of that. Um, reading them very closely, you're gaining context, contextual information. You create themes through your coding system and then continuously Go back and try to make things fit into smaller and smaller categories or fewer and fewer categories so that you can really get down to what is happening. Now, regardless of which one you go with, except for that one, content analysis, you will need to use the Institutional Review Board or the IRB. So this is a federal law. Any research that involves human subjects has to be approved by them. Um, so what we're going to need you to do is to get on that. Now, um, I'll come back to it in just a minute, but there's a link down here that will take you to where you need to go and we'll look at it together. Um, but this is from, from ethics. This is, this is really making sure that the work we do doesn't harm people or that there's not a, a, a 
huge risk of adverse effects. You know, even the best intentioned researchers can cause some pretty big problems if they're not extra careful with the way that they design their work. Uh, we're in the arts and sciences. You know, we're, we're sort of these soft sciences or, um, you know, the, the humanities. The work we do doesn't require us, you know, poking people with needles or um, injecting them with uh, different agents or making them run on a treadmill. You know, that's not what we do. We want to sit down and talk to people or give them a survey. However, there are protected groups like children, uh, prisoners, the elderly that the rules are a little different with. They need to be uh, really watched out for. Uh, a large part of this is because of people like Nazis. I mean, they would do terrible experiments. I mean, just unmentionable things um, that we want to make sure we never do again. A lot of everything they did, we want to make sure we never do again. But in terms of research, that was sort of the... The, the big one, if you will, that sort of made people think, you know, we're not evil like that. We're not doing anything near what they're doing, but ooh, we need to put some rules in place. More recently, though, it would be things like the Stanford prison study or the Milgram experiment. If you're familiar with those, um, the, the prison study was basically uh, how would people react when they got uh, some sort of power? Uh, would they use it against people? And they do, apparently, and it became very abusive. Uh, the Milgram experiment was when people thought that if they turned a wheel uh, at the direction of a person in a lab coat who they assumed to be a doctor, they never said that they were, they would hear people scream and they would be told you're shocking them, but that's what they're here for. Don't worry, they signed up for this. And how far would people go? Some people went as far as to when, no one was really being shocked by the way, um, to, to when they would turn it all the way and the people would stop screaming. What do you think happened to them or were supposed to have happened to them? Well, they're supposed to have died from the shock, uh, but people would still keep on going. They had a doctor telling them, this is what I'm supposed to do. And that goes back to those Nazis, right? I mean, you've got people who were um, sort of average folks who put all of their faith in one person who told them to do terrible things and they did it. So we want to make sure that we Stay away from that. Um, you probably fall under the IRB umbrella. However, what you're probably going to find is that once you uh, write your proposal for IRB, they're going to say, yep, you're exempt, no problem, you're good to go. Um, you'll get approved quickly. And you've got to do a little bit of training. So this week, you've got one thing to do, right? Your super simple, fast quiz or your, your survey. The other time should be spent getting ready for IRB. I mean, this is, it takes a little while. Let's look at it. Um, so here we go. IRB or CITI training program. Um, you can go to any of these and you'll use your GVSU login. So you may need to register if you've never done this before. All right. So when you get to this screen, let me move myself out of the way. Um, don't worry about this login part. Go here to login through my organization. Uh, click that one. And that will bring up a list of all the institutions connected to uh, this IRB. I mean, you got, you'll, you'll see the names on there as we go. Um, of course, we are Grand Canyon, Grand Valley. Oh, look, just that far from Harvard. So click on it. And it will usually, I just signed in, but you'll see this um, take you to a login page with your Grand Valley information. And if you do that, you will then come here. You'll probably, if you're a first timer, need to enter um, just some details, like make a profile. But once you get in here, uh, go to view courses. And these are the ones you're going to need to take. So you've got your basic course. Um, and then your RCR. So this one, I think you can hold off on, uh, but these two are required. So if we go here and hit review course, um, you've got FERPA information. So being uh, private, private, confidential, um, FDA regulations, this one is going to be the general one. 
you see my scores weren't great because a lot of this is going to be things that we won't do research with children nope don't care fda nope not a real big deal so you still have to do it because it's the basic course um, if you do the rcr concise you can do this one this one looks for authorship plagiarism um, research misconduct how it can be detrimental to your future if you want to do anything in academia especially then let's see maybe uh, if you need to get in here this is going to be refresher stuff so it's going to be things that have already been discussed that's why this one i believe you can hold off on and you'll need to do these two definitely start with this one rcr concise um, and that may be enough um, we're going to find that out and I will post that on the Blackboard site. Uh, but definitely take some time and look at this um, over the week. So I know that this video is pretty long, but again, think about it this way. If we were in a class doing two days a week giving lectures, it would be longer than this. Um, with all of that said, some of this you will not use. Matter of fact, you won't use 80% of what we just talked about because you're going to pick one of those things and run with that one. So I tried to be very surface level so that we could get through all of these. But if you are leaning toward one, um, which we're gonna find out next week, don't forget to do your survey. But if you have more questions specifically about one of these, go ahead and let me know. Um, otherwise, we can get into that later. But for this week, turn in your survey um, and do that IRB information. It's, it takes, a couple weeks to get your approval and we can't even apply for it yet because we don't know exactly the study that you want to do and we'll have to make that proposal so do the testing uh, get trained and then you will be all set for the next step all right thanks for sticking through it with me um, if you didn't you won't do your IRB so you won't know uh, but for everybody else thank you for doing that and as always if you need me let me know and I will see you next time